Okay, so welcome again. Um, my name is Natalie Appleyard. I'm the Socioeconomic Policy Analyst at Citizens for Public Justice. And I'm excited to be with you today, along with our co-lead, Emily. And I'll ask Emily to introduce herself and get us started. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, so as she said, my name is Emily. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the National Coordinator of Canada Without Poverty. Uh, and then not with us today is the third co-lead, which is uh, Campaign 2000. So we're just going to start um, today with a land acknowledgement. And I always purposefully never try to pre-think what I'm going to say so that what I do say is very meaningful and from the heart. So um, the building actually CWP and CPJ share a building in Ottawa on the unceded land of the Algonquin territory. It's also, Ottawa is also home to the largest Inuit population outside of the north, and many come to Ottawa for medical um, assistance, medical needs, and they end up staying in Ottawa for various reasons, but a lot of it does stem from not being able to afford to return to their communities, and this is really essential when we're thinking about the land we're on, because it's not just about acknowledging and um, simplifying a land acknowledgement. It's also thinking about the systems that determine which land belongs to who and um, how we can live on these lands. And a lot of the work that Chew on This, Dignity for All, our respective organizations, and a lot of you here today do when it comes to anti-poverty really involves centering Indigenous experiences, Indigenous-led services and programs designed by Indigenous people for Indigenous people, overturning systems of oppression that have legislated poverty and, um, you know, taking the Indian out of the person, uh, dating back from the start of the Indian Act. Um, when Canada was founded. So these are all very big policy pieces that have been operating in Canada for decades and centuries that still impact many communities today. And we always do our best acknowledging that Natalie and I are both uh, white settlers and do not personally have indigenous heritage, but acknowledging that we try to as always center the voices of indigenous people, um, make sure they are a part of our advisory groups and our consultations and our engagements and including policies that directly meet the needs of Indigenous people based off of what Indigenous people have determined by themselves. So thank you for being uh, with us today. I will leave it at that and pass it back to Natalie. Thanks, Emily. So as I mentioned, my name is Natalie and I used to her pronouns. I work with Citizens for Public Justice. So I'm joining you from unceded and uncentered Algonquin and Anishinaabeg territory. Um, about an hour from where I grew up near the Kitchissippi River, which is um, known to um, many people colonially as the Ottawa River or the Uruguay. So I'm uh, glad to be here and glad to share a little bit with you today about the Chuanis campaign, um, whether you are uh, an organizer that's been with us for years or whether this is your first time checking out the campaign. I think, um, I think it's a really, a uh, neat way for people to connect across the country. And I hope you'll find uh, some information and some tips today that are helpful as you're thinking about hosting your own event and how to incorporate the arts in your advocacy. So we're gonna start by talking a little bit about the Chew on This campaign and uh, an event that we're planning on Parliament Hill on October 17th. Um, and then we'll go through a few uh, considerations when you're planning your own local event, whether it's for Chew on This or for another, um, another campaign that you're part of. So um, we'll tell you a little bit about the campaign. And if you have not yet registered as a local organizer, but you would like to, uh, this is what the website looks like. And you can see there's a great big button in the middle that says registration. And that's where you can fill out the form and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us about your event. And then that also allows us to uh, show where all the events across Canada are taking place on the map. So if I flip to the two on this um, main web page, um, it's just loading now for you. So we'll scroll down. And you'll be able to see that there's a map that's going to load and it shows where people have already registered to host events across Canada. 
Oh, I apologize, my internet looks like it's being slow, so the map is taking a while to load. But you can see we've already got some organizers signed up. Uh, we have um, the Yukon Anti Poverty Coalition. We have a f uh, several events happening in Calgary, thanks to Poverty Talks Calgary. Uh, they're doing eight events, which is amazing uh, across the city. So as you zoom in, you can kind of see where things are happening. And if you click on the button on, on the pin, it will show you, um, you know, some details about the events so that folks can find your events and join you. Um, and it just helped to spread the word. So um, when you register as an organizer, that's one of the things that that helps us to do is to just show events that are taking place across the country from coast to coast to coast. So we would love to have you with us. Um, the Chew on This campaign is an initiative of Dignity for All, which as Emily mentioned, is co-led by Canada Without Poverty, Citizens for Public Justice and Campaign 2000. And this campaign is in its 10th year, actually, I realized recently, so our 10th anniversary year of calling for rights-based comprehensive policies to eradicate poverty in Canada. And the campaign has typically focused on food insecurity as an anchor, but we recognize that the experiences and impacts of poverty are all interconnected. And so we call for a range of policies that, um, that address these overlapping systems and that also recognize the underlying systemic causes of poverty and food insecurity in Canada. And so, um, you know, in relation to what Emily has already shared with the land acknowledgement, we recognize that the impacts of colonialism are very much uh, present today and ongoing and food security is certainly one of those. And we also recognize that you know, food insecurity is, is not just about food. It's not just about hunger. Food security is an, a matter of rights. It's about income security. It's about housing security. It's about climate change. It's about regularizing status. It's about working conditions. So what we really wanna do with the Chew on This campaign is provide an opportunity for communities to learn a little bit more about these underlying causes of food insecurity and, um, and to become aware of some of the rights-based policies that can actually effectively and equitably address food insecurity and the disproportionate ways that it impacts marginalized groups. So that's what the campaign is about. Um, and that's what we're asking you to engage your communities uh, on uh, this, this October, the events always take place on or around October 17th, which is the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. And again, we just want to raise awareness that um, food insecurity is a violation of the right to food and of our basic human rights, and that everyone living in Canada should has the right to be able to access nutritious, culturally appropriate food. And the government has a legal and a moral responsibility to create the conditions where people can enjoy these rights. So that's the main focus of the campaign. And um, again, we'd love to have folks across the country uh, sharing this information, uh, talking to people in their own communities about what are the local barriers to food security uh, where you live? What are the experiences of people? Uh, who's affected and why? And what are some of the solutions that you're looking for? So as much as this is a, a national campaign that we, we hope helps make you feel part of a broader movement, we hope it also provides you with a lot of opportunity to talk about um, your local context and uh, what your community is doing about it, what your community is calling for. Uh, so we're just going to tell you a little bit about our event coming up on uh, Parliament Hill. So the the rally that we're planning is our local uh, local to Ottawa uh, to on this event, and we're going to use it as a bit of a case study. But then we're going to spend some time talking about considerations for planning your own events, and uh, we'll have a bit more uh, engagement from folks in the in the webinar, if they're interested in sharing some ideas and suggestions, uh, we can add to the slides together. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're going with this. 
so Emily, I'll maybe throw it to you to talk a little bit about our event coming up on the Hill. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we are having an event on Parliament Hill and uh, we decided to make it an opportunity for um, people to learn and raise awareness. And we want to invite ministers, MPs, senators, um, anyone working on Parliament Hill and in the surrounding area to be able to come and um, witness an expert panel of people with lived experience or expert advocates talk about issues of food insecurity. Um, now, the funny thing is, when we planned this, we had originally started for noon, and it turns out that the All Party Anti-Poverty Caucus uh, is having a meeting from noon to one, which definitely put a little bit of a wrench in our plans, but it will be good because that might mean that um, a lot of people who are part of the caucus um, or interested in the caucus will be sort of tuned in already to issues of poverty and food insecurity on that day around our rally. So we might be able to see an increase of uh, government and politician uh, workers coming to our rally. So we are planning on around 1230 having uh, people who are pre-registered and are planning to come uh, can arrive as early as 1230. Uh, we are hoping to incorporate some sort of artistic engagement because we're not doing postcards this year. Because of COVID, we were just a little hesitant about an activity that involves handing things uh, between people. And you just never know what the risks of transmission. Um, so we're hoping to use some of those chew on this bags that we have many, many uh, of and have people write reflections, thoughts, ideas. Um, it could be very concrete, it could be very abstract um, about what food insecurity means to them uh, or about what poverty means to them or any issues that impact them, inequity, inequality, oppression. Um, and we're hoping to display them and, and hoping to invite the senators and MPs and politicians um, to come in and read some of them and, and see what people um, that they're supposed to be representing and serving are saying about what it's like to live in food insecurity or witness food insecurity happening to their neighbors and friends and family. Uh, we will then have a speakers panel. Uh, right now we have an elder um, opening the ceremony um, and we hope to have a few people um, in the Ottawa area uh, speak to food uh, insecurity. We do have someone from the Inuit uh, Women's Center um, based in Ottawa to come speak. Uh, and uh, a couple of the other speakers are still to, to be determined. Um, but we want to also conclude it with a poetry performance. And uh, our poet will be King Kimbit, who is a local Ottawa poet. She is the daughter of immigrants and has a long poetry career in, um, like, I think over 10 years now, she's been creating art. And she's um, roots a lot of her poetry and art in social justice issues. So she's going to be a perfect way we can conclude conclude this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we really wanted po a, a poet there or, or some sort of musician or someone who can help engage our audience in an artistic way, because we often talk about policy and, and programs and delivery, and it starts to become a very technical, uh, technical, event or uh you know people I think it starts to almost become abstract because we're talking about statistics and numbers and in and, and very technical things and I think at the essence of it we also want to move people we want to make people care because you know at the core of all of this movement has to be people who actually care about eradicating poverty and care about the food insecurity that is happening in their communities and um, that's why we are calling for people to incorporate arts in their in their campaigns and, and rallies this year and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, momentarily but uh, you know we're really hoping that by engaging the arts we'll also have more engaging and moving uh, advocacy and then you know we because we all have parliamentarians and senators and MPs there uh, hopefully we can do a group, group photo it's great for you know uh, great for our campaign to show that hey we we are here and and, and people are listening to us um, followed by some more art um, and you know we'll probably disperse around 2 30 so that's what our campaign is going to look like um, you know, there's definitely always going to have to be room for contingency and, uh, you know, we're, we're praying for a nice sunny day, but 
um, we're, you know, we're doing this on the hill. And uh, as some of you might know, the hill is all under construction. So, you know, there's a few considerations that you have to have when picking your spot. Um, we had to get a permit, which just got approved today. Um, thanks, Natalie uh, got that in. Um, so definitely some of these considerations we'll sort of dive into um, just in case you are planning on uh, hosting a rally on perhaps like your local city hall or um, minister's office, etc. So yeah, um, I hope that kind of gives you a sense of what an event can look like. I mean, I, ours has a lot more resources and staffing than some of your local events might be able to get put together, which is totally fine. Um, but yeah, maybe, uh, Natalie, we can start talking about some considerations. Great. Thanks, Emily. So this is where we're, we're hoping that this um, feels like a little bit more of a, uh, an opportunity to workshop some ideas for you and for your events. Uh, so we've got up front a list of considerations that we're going to go through kind of one by one, <clears throat> thinking about planning your own local chew on this event and how to integrate the arts. Um, again, this could be used for other campaigns as well, not just Chew on this, but uh, hopefully you'll try it out this October for Chew. So when you're planning your local event, here are a few considerations that we're going to go over. So first of all, what we want you to think about is what is the key message or takeaway that you want people to leave your event with? And that can be a variety of things. It can be a particular piece of information. It could be a call to action. It could be a feeling. Uh, it could be a better understanding of, you know, what people experience uh, if they're living with food insecurity. Or it could be maybe uh, feeling more connected to other advocates in your community who are calling for the same thing. So there can be a variety of key messages or takeaways or, or goals for your event. And, um, you know, that's going to depend on, on your group, that's going to depend on your target audience, where you're at, <clears throat> and, and how you've been engaging in this work already. So that's the first question that we're going to put to you is, is what is it that you hope people will take away from this event? And then once you've decided that we want you to think about what's the best way to communicate that message or that takeaway? And how might the arts be able to help you with that? We'll talk a little bit about considering your target audience, uh, increasing the accessibility of your event, and keeping in mind that you're going to um, plan your event with uh, a certain scope that reflects the resources that you have available. And that can be both uh, volunteer capacity or staff, that can be money for resources or to rent a location or sound system or to pay honoraria for speakers or artists. So the resources can, can be time, money, or materials, um, space, all, all these different types of resources that uh, are going to vary from group to group. And then once you've kind of come up with your vision for your event, then you start to work backwards and figure out what are the steps that you need to take to actually execute this event. And then I think something that is easy to forget sometimes is this last consideration we'll talk about is how do you want people to follow up after your event? So you've, you've shared this message or this takeaway, then what? Do you want people to be able to stay in touch with you? Or do you want to be able to stay in touch with them? Um, if you're engaging with local media or with local elected officials, is there some kind of follow-up meeting that you're looking for? Or is there a commitment or an action that you're asking them to take? So we're just going to go through each of these, um, most of them kind of one by one. And uh, we have uh, different slides where we've started with some ideas, but we want to invite some conversation here, some ideas. So um, if folks are on the call and would like to unmute or share in the chat some ideas, uh, you are welcome to so that you're not only hearing Emily and me speak. Um, but uh, just a reminder again that this is being recorded. So depending on your level of comfort with, um, with that showing up in the recording, um, then you can, again, you can use the chat. Uh, you can send a direct message to Emily or myself if you'd prefer your name not to be shared. Or if you'd like to, you, you're welcome to unmute and share an idea. Uh, so let's just get started with some examples of some key messages and takeaways that you might want people to leave with. 
So we've told you a little bit about um, two on this as a campaign and, and some of the, uh, the reasons that, that we've launched this campaign and that, um, that it keeps going from year to year. Uh, so some of the key messages that you might consider are, you know, that food security is a human right, that um, food security has certain international human rights obligations tied to it that Canada as a country has agreed to. And so there is this international human rights obligation. Food security is not just a, a nice to have, or it's not a matter of charity. It's not because the government or people living in this country are so magnanimous that, you know, out of the kindness of our hearts, we donate to food charity. It's actually a right. And when we talk about food security as a right, or, or even when we talk more broadly about poverty being a violation of our human rights, that just means that, again, the government of Canada and, and multiple levels of government have a certain duty. So they're referred to as duty bearers. And then people living in Canada are the rights bearers. So everyone in Canada, regardless of status or citizenship, uh, regardless of any other facet of your identity, we all share these inherent human rights. And the right to food is one of them. And the right to an adequate standard of living is kind of more broadly uh, where this comes from. And that's in Article 25 of the UN uh, Declaration on Human Rights. So Canada has an obligation to create the conditions in which people's human rights are upheld. So again, you're not gonna fit all that on a banner, but maybe your key message is just that food, food security or food is a human right. And not just any food, but affordable, nutritious, culturally appropriate food. So that's one way you might take it. You might, you might highlight sort of the, the human rights lens to this. You might wanna highlight again that food charity is not the solution. It meets people's immediate needs. Uh, we're not trying to throw shade on <laughs> food banks, but we recognize and, and food banks recognize that they're not the solution to food insecurity. They're meeting an immediate need, but they're not actually addressing the underlying causes of why people need the food bank in the first place. So those are a couple uh, examples of some key messages or takeaways that you might want. Maybe your key takeaway is that you just want people to have a better understanding of what people are actually living with in your community with regards to food security or what barriers they're facing. Um, so again, depending on what key message or takeaway you wanna work with, then that's gonna, um, that's gonna help guide you in deciding, well, how are you gonna communicate that? How are you gonna help people leave with that? Um, does anyone wanna share any other examples of, of key messages or takeaways that you're considering for your local event? Maybe there's a, a local spin on any of these things. No pressure again, you can share in the chat or you can unmute if you're interested. And we can always come back to it too. I don't wanna to put anyone on the spot. Emily, do you wanna add anything about this one in terms of some key messages or takeaways? No, I, I think you covered it very thoroughly. Uh, we can we can come back for sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So some folks again, you might um, you know if if you are a local service provider, you might want to maybe you have some key piece of information about what food security looks like in your community, or um, you know some local initiative that's happening. Um, I know I'm really excited uh, to get to participate in um, an event on October 5th, which is going to be designated as uh, the Right to Food Day here in Ottawa and with uh, the Parkdale um, Food Center. Uh, and they've done a, a local survey about food insecurity and things like that. So again, you know, each group might have their own local focus, their own local messaging. Um, and then the with Chew on this, it's just an invitation again to feel part of this broader movement of people who across the country are talking about these underlying causes and the need for rights-based solutions. So once you've decided on your key message or your takeaway, then 
again, you're going to think about, okay, what's the best way to communicate that uh, or to leave people with that, to help people experience what you want them to experience or to learn what you want them to learn or to mobilize people to do what you want them to do. Um, and I've framed this as kind of two categories of, of strategies, and I'm sure there's overlap and they're not, you know, really neat, distinct categories. But I think you can, we can think about either uh, co-creation or presentation. And I think probably what most of us are used to and, and what we're using this webinar right now is kind of a presentation format, right? We're sharing expertise, stories or information. And, you know, so usually that's, you're trying to convey certain information um, and, and build understanding or, um, or ask people to do something. And so um, how that can look at, it, at various events, uh, could be uh, a speaker's panel, uh, it could be a Q&A, um, you could have a performance. Uh, as Emily mentioned, great, we're excited to have King Kimbit do a poetry performance at our rally, but it could be theater, it could be song, it could be poetry, it could be uh, some other written piece, it could be a film, it could be an art exposition. So again, there's, there's no shortage of options in terms of how you might use the arts to convey certain information or uh, evoke a certain response from people, uh, again, film screenings. And then some, you know, sometimes people just, I know there've been, uh, we've had local organizers uh, at different churches or places of worship across the country, and they just kept it really simple. And they just had like an information table at their place of worship where they could uh, share information with people as as they're mingling. So it doesn't have to be <laughs> a huge thing, and that's that's what we want to help um, people to to think about is how uh, how your event can can shift to fit the scale that that suits that suits your capacity and and your resources. Uh, so again, the presentation side people are probably a bit more familiar with, um, but again, instead of just having someone, you know, giving a speech or going through slides like I am, um, you know, how much more powerful is it when you have um, a performing artist who can share that information, but in, in such a more powerful way. <laughs> and again, these events are not necessarily about doing a deep dive into the policy, um, into the policy weeds, um, you know, unless that is your group's thing. And, you know, by all means, do that if that's what you love. But, you know, if, if this is kind of just about reaching the general population, um, again, you, you want a simple message and you want people to, uh, to leave feeling like they've been impacted by that information and that that information is going to move them to think differently or, or behave differently or make different choices or maybe strengthen their resolve to do something that, that they're already inclined to do. Um, so again, the presentation uh, strategy is something that many of us are familiar with, but I think, again, we can, we can all get a little bit more creative about how, how we use that strategy. And then the other strategy that I'm going to talk to a little bit about is co-creation. And this is um, something where you are creating the content, you're building knowledge or understanding uh, together with the other people at your rally. And I should mention too that these things can happen before, during, or after your event, right? Like you could have co-creation leading up to your event, and then maybe the event is more in presentation style. Um, and then maybe you, you come back afterwards and you meet again with the people that were at your event or that participated in, and, and maybe you do some co-creation again to figure out your next steps. But um, as an example, at our rally, uh, we're thinking of, uh, again, either using our, uh, some of the paper too on the bags that we've used in previous years to create some kind of visual art. Um, we might also do some, uh, some shared mural making. So we'll be providing a prompt, like, you know, what does food security look like to you? Or, um, you know, what, what would you need to feel like, you know, we lived in a food secure community. And people could draw, they could write, 
compose. Um, so in that way, we would we'll, we'll be co-creating some kind of visual mural or visual representation of these reflections. So we're inviting people to kind of think and reflect, but and then express their feelings about that. Um, so it could be um, when you're co-creating, it can be exploratory where you're, again, getting people to kind of explore how they feel about something or how they might respond. Uh, it can be expressive of how they're feeling. I think for the poetry performance that we're going to hear, even though it's presentation style, that's, that's going to be sort of a, an expressive um, response to, uh, to the realities of, of injustice. Um, so it can be expressing something that people already feel or know, or it can be responsive. So um, once they've uh, engaged with your information or with the stories that people have shared, how, how do people want to respond? And that can be just that, you know, that could be as simple as paying attention to how your body is physically responding to the information about, um, you know, rates of, of food insecurity in Canada or in your community or what it looks like day to day for people to, to live with that. So uh, co-creation can be um, any number of these things. Uh, co-creation can also be, you know, shared planning um, or, you know, composing a, a shared letter or an open letter to your member of parliament. So again, it, um, it can incorporate the arts as much as you want. And I think the arts can be a powerful tool to do that and to help people explore those responses and those expressions. But it, um, you know, it can also be depending on people's level of comfort, it could be something a little bit more um, straightforward in terms of, yeah, write, writing a shared letter, or uh, maybe it's a letter to the editor or something like that. But anyway, anything where folks are participating together to co-create something can be a really powerful communications strategy as well. And sometimes it's a strategy to lead to a communication product. So it can be the, the means of communicating or it can be, um, it can lead to a, a, a different communication product. Uh, so again, some examples that I've shared already are the, the idea of a shared mural, or some kind of group composition. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the Raging Grannies, for example, but they often have these songs that they've composed to popular tunes where they've altered the lyrics. And so it's a bit of satire and, and just a bit of humor. Um, chanting at rallies, that's a, that can be sort of a co-creative um, strategy as well, where you know maybe some people are coming up with the chants on the spot, or maybe you have some pre-prepared, but people are able to participate in that and it's a more participatory experience. So um, again, I'm happy to welcome any other suggestions from folks that are in the webinar, uh, either in the chat or by unmuting. If you've had experience with any of these different communication strategies, or if you have questions about how you might go about these things. Um, so again, that is, open and available to you. Emily, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just on the uh, the note of co-creation, uh, you did touch on this already, Natalie, but just also thinking that some events you just might want to sort of limit to your community or just maybe your church or your community center and other events you might want to engage the public more and that's where co-creation can be a very effective tool because while people might be interested in passing by you know let's say you're hosting at a park and seeing a presentation um, if they see a table with markers and um, I know in a lot of these arts and advocacy rallies it usually one of the most accessible and effective methods is just simple pieces of paper or some sort of medium you can write on where people can write a message, draw a picture, et cetera. And that's a really effective way to get people sort of in your surrounding area to be intrigued and think like, oh, what is going on? And, you know, when people can actually add to a mural or add to some sort of drawing um, or, you know, contribute in some very physical way, it, it, it creates a, a much more lasting impact than it can um, with a presentation. That being said, of course, capacity and, you know, 
October COVID, if people are very cautious and not wanting to um, get too close to each other, like there's definitely a lot of considerations, but uh, I just wanted to make that point about the co-creation is it's also a very good like awareness, engaging the public um, strategy. So if you're hoping to have a more big event, uh, definitely would urge you to think about um, some ideas around that. Thanks, Emily. That's a great point. And and again, some of these things might be uh, something that you've been preparing for ahead of time, and then you're going to present what you've co-created, or it might be that on the spot co-creation that, that you're going to invite people to engage in. So great point on sort of, you know, your target audience again, are you, um, who are you trying to reach? Um, is, are you creating a separate event that people are gonna pre-register for? Or are you going out in public and hoping to just catch passers-by? Uh, and you know, often it's, it's a mix of both. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk uh, about, and we won't go into uh, great depth on any of these uh, specific points, but again, just a few considerations that we want to um, encourage you to, to think about as you're planning. Um, Emily mentioned already, for example, the need for permits sometimes, depending on where you would like to host your event, or if you're hosting a digital event, again, just thinking about what sort of digital platforms uh, you'll need, and, you know, do people need to have a subscription or an account with that platform. Um, in terms of um, events out in the community, in-person events in the community, just, just a heads up that, you know, sometimes people um, have thought about having their events outside, you know, maybe a grocery store or uh, a library or, um, you know, transit areas. And so it's just a heads up to check on who, whether that, um, that land is publicly or privately owned because, um, if it's a grocery store, for example, usually those strip malls are owned by some property manager. So you'd hate to put in all that work to planning your event and then, uh, you know, have all your folks there and be asked to leave. I'm, obviously, you could choose how you want to respond to that request. <laughs> um, but um, just just a thought to, um, to, to look into beforehand. Um, whether a permit would be required or permission or whether you are intentionally occupying a space. Uh, that maybe you don't have permission to uh, to be at, but if that is part of the of like a protest or a rally, for example, then again, just it, it's uh, it's important that that be an intentional decision as opposed to an afterthought. Um, when you're choosing your location, again, whether that is in person or digital, uh, just to again consider uh, accessibility and how people are going to experience the event or access the event like in their physical bodies. So um, that, can, that can look like, you know, actually like getting to the event or like accessing, uh, getting, gaining entry to the event. Uh, it can include uh, being able to participate fully in, in the activities that are planned, again, whether that's in person or, or virtual. Um, it might have to do with, you know, having gender neutral washrooms available or accessible washrooms available. So again, just a few considerations about, you know, if people are showing up to these things, whether in person or virtual, in their physical bodies, <laughs> their bodies are going to be responding in different ways. So um, what, what plans do you have in place to make sure that people's bodies are, um, are welcome, that they're acknowledged? Uh, and that there's some thought given to, uh, again, the accessibility, but also um, maybe just, you know, the responses that people are going to be feeling in their bodies and the ways that they're going to be engaging with one another. Obviously, with the pandemic ongoing, that there are some, um, you know, really specific considerations that you might give to what it means for a bunch of bodies to be showing up together. Or maybe you want to think about what it feels or looks like for different bodies to be uh, engaging somewhere, whether or not there might be police presence or, um, you know, different power imbalances in terms of who's at the event, who's speaking at the event, um, things like that. So again, just to, to have some consideration to that embodied experience and the accessibility of the event. Um, other pieces 
that have more to do with sort of what resources are available to you, uh, would be what sort of supplies and materials you'll need for the activities that you're doing. You know, do you need a sound system? Um, and, and I'm gonna uh, just make a little PSA here <laughs> that often for people who, um, who have no trouble with hearing, there's often an assumption that like, oh, I can, I can yell, we're okay. <laughs> Um, but actually, a lot of people, you know, who, who may be hard of hearing, um, they, they may not speak up uh, about it being difficult to hear the speakers, but especially if, you're, if your event is really centered on, on a speaker, on, on some kind of verbal communication or, or auditory conveying uh, information, um, having a, a mic or a megaphone, um, you know, a simple microphone and amp you can often get for, for pretty inexpensively. I, I know for our setup on the hill, we're renting some equipment and, you know, for the whole monitor, speaker, mic, mic stand, all that, it's it's under $150, which uh, again, might not be within your budget, but just something to consider whether there's, there's some way that you can make sure that um, in terms of your supplies and materials that you're not thinking just about, you know, paper and, markers and signs and banners and things like that, but also uh, if there's any kind of audio visual equipment needed. Uh, another consideration that we'd encourage you to, to think about upfront is whether there will be honoraria or gifts required. Um, typically, if you're inviting a, a local elder, uh, you would be presenting a gift of tobacco or if it's an Inuit elder, uh, maybe a gift of tea. Um, but just be aware of the different protocol if you are inviting uh, a local elder or a traditional knowledge keeper. And again, if you're inviting speakers or performers that you consider whether you're able to offer honoraria, uh, whether that's in your budget, things like that. Um, consider how many volunteers you might have available. Um, you could have an event where you have like five diehard people who are there and they're gonna have an impact and they could create some kind of you know, really cool visual or just their presence would uh, get a lot of attention. Um, or maybe you have, you know, 50 people that you can mobilize for a march or a rally. So think about how many volunteers you'd have available. Um, maybe um, I've seen one really cool example by Beautiful Trouble where they didn't have a lot of people, but they had used all these hard hats that they laid out on this large green space to uh, raise awareness about um, safe work conditions and things like that. So again, maybe you don't have a lot of people, but you've got a lot of um, materials that you can use in space, or maybe you don't have a lot of space materials, but you've got a lot of people that you can mobilize down the street. Um, give some consideration to how you're going to promote or recruit people to your event. Again, do you want people to pre-register? Are you just grabbing passers-by? Is there a mix of those? How will you communicate that? Can you use your local media, um, social media, email lists? Who can you partner with to help spread the word? Uh, and then the last two that I'll go over is just government relations and media outreach. There are some sample um, talking points and a sample press release in our Chew on This Organizers Toolkit, which you can access from our website. And um, so, there are materials there that, that you can um, that you can grab and tailor to your specific event to invite uh, local government officials or members of the media. And uh, I know we're getting close to the end of our time here. And um, again, if people have ideas or questions, we want to give an opportunity for you to ask those or share those. Um, but the last thing that I'll mention um, from the slides here is just to think again about uh, following up. What do you want to happen after your event? So again, with government, um, if you're inviting them to your event, um, often it's a great opportunity to invite them to meet with you afterwards to have a bit more of an in-depth discussion about some of the changes that you'd like to see or some of the things you'd like them to support. Um, Maybe you will have a sign up sheet so that people can stay in touch. Um, maybe you'd collect email or just make sure that people can see how to follow you on social media. Um, so again, thinking about how you might stay connected with the folks that, that come to your event that might wanna learn more or volunteer at the next event. And think about encouraging people to share 
the message or the takeaway that they got from your event with others. So again, what are you asking people to do afterwards? Do you want them to go tell someone else about what they learned? Do you want them to sign a petition or write a letter? Um, how do you want them to, to take that message with them and, and share it with others? And, and then lastly, if you did do some kind of co-creation, either uh, leading up to your event or at your event, you might want to consider how you're going to showcase or inspire some shared art projects uh, following that event. So again, um, instead of uh, this just being like a one-off thing, think about some ways that people can continue to engage with the information and the people that they've connected with at your event. Because again, we do hope that this is a really great opportunity for networking and for advocates in your community to get to know one another and, and to feel a sense of connection with advocates across the country to know that you know, you're not alone in fighting these monumental issues. And uh, lastly, Emily and I and our teams are here to help. So again, I mentioned we have some materials for organizers and I'll put that link in the chat. But basically, if you visit chewonthis.ca, you'll get to our website and um, you'll see information for about the campaign. You'll see the registration link. Um, and if you click on the registration link, that's where um, if you, if you scroll down to the bottom where there's a link to jump down, there are some materials for organizers that you can use. So um, Emily's prepared this really great background around food security. It's just one page double sided. So that's something that's really easy to, to have available digitally for people or to print off in hard copy. And uh, it's currently available in English and French and we are waiting for uh, an Inuktitut you know, translation that will be available as well. Uh, there's an organizer toolkit that has all the things. It has a sample press release and media talking points. It has the backgrounder. It has um, some checklists for to think about, you know, to-do lists before, during, and after your event. Um, there's a link to a shared folder that has uh, graphics and images and sample posts for using on social media. And of course, you can always just reach out to Emily or myself directly. Um, but again, we'd love to take some questions or hear other ideas for uh, events and ways that you can incorporate the arts. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Emily, if you have uh, something that I've rushed through or that you want to go back to or, or if folks, uh, again, in the webinar have any uh, questions or, or comments that they'd like to share. Oh, Natalie, you did an awesome job. You, I think you covered it all. Um, so we'll just open it up to questions um, or like even if you just want to share um, some information about what your local event will look like, that's also super helpful. Um, yeah. Do we have any brave souls who want to share? <laughs> I know there have been some neat events in past two years. Uh, so I know that there's been a, a multi-faith group in the Danforth in Toronto that did this really amazing parade. Uh, I know the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition has hosted an event where they served Bannock and invited the community to come and, uh, and talk about food insecurity. Again, I've mentioned that there's folks from different um, places of worship that have incorporated that into a worship service or had that information available, um, you know, maybe over the weekend. Um, so we've, we've seen quite a few different types of events uh, and we're hoping, you know, even if you're still thinking and brainstorming about what you're going to do this year and if you're not sure, um, we would love to hear how it goes and uh, we'd really encourage everyone to use hashtag two on this on social media, share photos and videos of your events, or um, if you want to promote your events on social media, we'll retweet them and share them out. And again, if you've registered uh, as an organizer on the website, then people would be able to find you from the map, again, on the main page. So we're excited to see what people do with the campaign this year and, um, and hope to hear all about it. And uh, and to connect with folks uh, again afterwards about what next steps could look like.
So again, I'm not gonna put anyone here today on the spot. So I'm going to, uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap things up and stop the recording and, uh, and we'll stick around for a few extra minutes in case anyone uh, has questions or wants to share some ideas. So thanks for joining us today, uh, whether you're joining live or you're watching the recording. And again, please remember to visit chewonthis.ca for more information and don't hesitate to reach out to Emily or myself. So thanks for being with us today and I hope you have a great event.